So we have a, say, a, a, a landscape architecture team, my team, which is the Sustainable Futures team, which gets involved in research uh, projects to do with offsite. Um, we run all the sustainability standards, so we, we know Martin and his colleagues at the BRE rather well, sometimes a little bit too well, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, we also get involved in, say, community engagement, um, communications, urban design, and we have a planning team as well. So we like to think that we can take a project, however big, from the very beginning right through to the very end. Um, and and one, one bit that was kind of on your, on your circle, Ian, but I would, I would sort of maybe emphasize a bit more is the whole thing about feedback. Because the, the thing that's sort of missing in, in all of this from our perspective as designers is, is that feedback. Actually, you know, we only ever get to hear of something when it's gone wrong. Uh, we, we don't get to hear about it when it goes right. And, and we don't even usually hear from the people who occupy our buildings. So from a housing perspective, that's a, that's a bit of an issue, I think. Um, in terms of services uh, relevant to the offsite community, we, we work on projects with manufacturers. So we've done a lot of projects with manufacturers where we look at what the manufacturing team are offering and we really tell them whether or not we think it can deliver the type of housing that we are asked to design. So it's a kind of looking at the problem the other way around, um, which we think is important right now because you can, you can design a very good manufacturing system and you can bring it to market and then find that sadly nobody wants to buy the thing that you've brought to market. So you've got to be careful uh, to make sure that um, what, you're, what you can deliver is a is good, is good quality outcome. And, and with, the, with the current push for numbers, we are a little bit worried that the whole issue of quality, and I'm not talking about award-winning quality here, I'm talking about quality that's a little bit more basic. So quality in terms of spatial quality, long-term flexibility of buildings, um, robustness, um, insurability, investability, all those, all those good things. Um, and then, you know, so, so we give technical advice to our clients and manufacturers, and then we do all the normal architectural projects work, working alongside um, manufacturers. And, and Ian made, made, made a point which I'd just like to correct you on, which was that you know, the manufacturers never get involved. Well, I'm going to show you a bunch of projects where the manufacturer does get involved. And you know, perhaps that's lucky from our point of view, or perhaps it's the fact that we've been talking and thinking about this for a decade, and it's only in the last four or five years that things have started to ramp up. So this is sort of a graph of the sort of, it's actually our, our, our workload um, over the last five years in terms of specifically off-site prefabricated projects. So you know, the growth is fairly obvious. Pros and cons, I probably don't really need to talk about the pros to this audience. A couple of cons that might not have been covered already is that we definitely think you need early engagement with the manufacturer. So, and, and one of the reasons why the design profession doesn't do that right now is because procurement for lots of agencies and lots of clients says, no, we're not going to do that now. We're going to tender the whole project at a certain point and then we'll decide how we're going to build it. We are never, ever going to get to a prefabricated, high quality um, uh, construction industry if we leave procurement until after we've designed the building. You'll just keep on doing, making the same mistakes. Designers will never know how to make things better. So you've got to engage with manufacturers earlier on. You've got to have that d DFMA type process where you decide what is the most appropriate methodology for building this building and then go and talk to and if necessary pay some of the manufacturers to come and talk to you at an early stage. Don't leave it until after procurement. The designer needs to understand the DFMA, we've heard all about that. There is pressure on the client and their decision making. You know that, that whole business about um, you know there's the discipline imposed by factory production you know, has, a, has, a, has an impact straight back onto the client. You can't hold up decision making if you've booked a slot in the factory. And for some of our clients, that's proved to be quite tricky, you know, because you might have a sub board and then a senior board, and senior board might only meet every three months, but you can't wait, for, you can't wait that long. So you've got to have a decision making process which supports the design process and in turn allows a factory uh, process to, uh, to happen. I don't think I need to explain this too much, really, other than saying that 
the project and where it fits on this scale uh, needs to be considered. So there are some projects, as Ian was pointing out, where you can't get the bigger components onto site. So you've got to decide early on um, which, which, of those uh, uh, which of those component types or which of those uh, manufacturing types are suitable. Um, and we've just done a big exercise with a client looking at, I think, 54 sites and about 1,000 units um, and putting them into batches. So instead of saying, well, we'll do this site like this and we'll do this site like this, you put <coughs> batches of sites together and you say, well, we'll do 15 sites as panelized, we'll do 15 sites as closed panel systems, perhaps we'll have bathroom pods for another 10 or we'll mix the two together and so on. And that all comes down to access arrangements, existence of trees, whether or not you can crane, whether you have to crane over a building or not, and so on. And then going to the full um, volumetric. I suppose what I would say is that there is also work to be done, you know, so there's a lot of work being done on the volumetric side, which, and I'm going to show mostly some volumetric projects, but um, there hasn't been, I don't think, enough work done, certainly on the, on the, um, on the in the housing industry, on prefabricated facades um, and, uh, and groundworks. So there is still quite a lot of room for innovation, development and improvement, not just on the on the prefabrication process we've got working, but there's a bunch of others which actually need to work together and different manufacturers need to collaborate, as you, as you pointed out. So I thought I would show this just to illustrate the impact that this type of activity has on, on a business. So there are two projects here, one the yellow and one the blue. Um, uh, the yellow one is the off-site project, which I'll show you more about in a minute. And they're both roughly the same scale, so it's the same quantum of, of development. And the left-hand um, axis is our resource time. So we, we spent roughly the same amount of time at stage three designing and detailing the building. Then with the, as the off-site project started to be delivered, we simply, you know, we got on with some other work. With the traditional project, the contractor got on with some work and then rang us up 10 times a day for the next year and a half. Guess which one of these two was most profitable for us and for the, you know, the, the site team? You know, so our, our sort of resource can be sort of described as a marker or as an indicator of the behavior of the rest of the, of the system, if you like. So with this one, there's an equally steep curve behind with the offsite for the, the planning decision and the decision making. So all that was done quickly, and then the build happened as quickly. But it's interesting that the resource times for the detailed design is pretty similar. It's just what happens afterwards that's dramatically different. I don't think I need to explain that, that to this audience. Um, we've, we've done quite a lot of uh, volumetric modular buildings using slip-formed um, cores and piled foundations. The DFMA guide, the RIBA DFMA guide, and the government's construction strategy say some things about how we're going to get there. So the government 2025 20, strategy says, well, we want to aim for 50% faster delivery, 33% lower costs, 50% lower emissions, and 50% improvements in exports. I bet that 50% is rising every day. Um, the DFMA guide that Ian talked about um, talks about some similar figures, which I think can be met. You know, we're certainly seeing 20 plus percent, up to 40 or 50% reduction in site times. We're seeing huge reductions in on-site labor. I think it's probably higher than 70%. We're getting to 98% of recycling um, waste, and uh, we haven't done much measurement on the reduction in pollution, but you know, I think it's higher than 20%. But the cost reduction, not, I don't see it yet in the kind of areas we're working in, simply because I don't see the scale. The scale hasn't grown to the point where those costs are available. So what we're seeing, I, I think, is what we're seeing is we're seeing parity between the best off-site and traditional construction, particularly in the southeast. Um, and the gains are in the time. So I don't think I particularly need to talk much more about this. But I suppose in terms of decision making and client drivers, um, in the current market, stable costs are really important for people. So clients and investors are 
are interested in knowing that factory production is going to help them to fix the costs. It doesn't have to be necessarily cheaper than traditional, but knowing that it's fixed and it's not going to um, be subject to huge inflation. Um, the point about the team as well, I mean, lots of, lots of Ian's um, circular wheel issues are resolved if you have repetitive work. So if you have the same team who are working together again and again, and that comes back also to the whole procurement issue. I mean, it's interesting that the only, the only work stream in our business that is really team-based is the off-site work. All the other types of projects, while there is repeat work with clients, but we rarely get to work with the same consultant team for the same client and the same contractor. In fact, I would say that almost never happens. Whereas working with the off-site teams that we're working with, there is almost an understanding that the same team will go on together to the next project. So it's just a completely different attitude, really, to, to that, whole, that whole process. So the, the sort of issue of procurement and how we bring together teams um, to work together um, currently um, in the same way that making the decision about what the building is made of at the last possible moment, you know, both of those things are actually preventing us from being as efficient and are probably costing us money rather than saving us money. So j j just to flick through some of the work that we've done, and all of it is manufactured off-site in factories, um, about, say, 80%, 75-80%, I would say. So this is a volumetric modular project at the tower, uh, uh, affordable housing and a hotel <coughs> in Wembley above a transfer slab with retail below. Um, and there's almost nothing repetitive about the plan form of the tower. It's very repetitive in the vertical axis, but it's not repetitive at all in the horizontal axis. So the lesson for modular construction or volumetric construction for us is that if, see, if, you can, if you can make it stack, you can make it work. A student accommodation building which is next door to it, which is also occupied. This, this was the study project that I showed earlier on in terms of the resource time. So this was designed and built and open within 18 months. And um, another student building on, in the same area started on site um, at the same time as this one and is still being worked on six months after this one finished. And uh, would anyone like to hazard a guess at what the income from an 800 bed student building is per annum? Rough guess? Come on, you're still awake. I won't ask you to stand up. It's about five million. It's about five million. So, so in terms of your, in terms of the build cost, you know that will pay for quite a substantial increase in the actual cost of the building. So even if you were a few percentage points more expensive than traditional construction, you'll pay for it with the additional income or the early income or the savings on your borrowings to, to fund the project or whatever. So that's another thing that the industry isn't good at in terms of your skills gap. The, the, the estimation, you know, the, as you said, the QS purchasing behavior has no clue absolutely zero clue about any savings in terms of preliminaries or any additional benefits the client might get in terms of savings on borrowings or early income coming in from rental projects. So for us, the sort of sweet spot for, for this kind of prefabrication is definitely in projects where there is a rental income to be gained. But that could be social rent, it can be private rent, it can be you know, a mixture of, of, of the above. Um, this one is under construction at the moment, which we think is going to be the tallest modular building in Europe. Um, we're open to being corrected on that, if anyone's got, one, got a taller one. Um, and that will be open for next September student um, intake. Um, those three were all, are all being built by Vision Modular Structures working with Tide. So Tide acts as a sort of developer client. They, they get, get control of the site, either through an agreement with the, with the landowner 
employers get planning permission and then they construct the building and then hand it over um, on completion. So there's a very sort of tight, close-knitted relationship between them and us, which enables us to do this kind of circular, repetitive um, operation where they're constantly improving the work in the factory, we're constantly improving our service to them, we're learning from each other on each project, and we are making the system work better each time. Um, this one is under construction um, in Greenwich at the moment with Essential Living. Uh, so this is a private rental 250 unit uh, development. Um, and this has been uh, designed at detailed stage. So we, we took this over from another architect um, post planning um, and, and sort of converted it to a modular design. So this, this one's going to be quite interesting because it's sort of the first purpose-built PRS building um, that we've done as an off-site construction project. And we think there's a, I think it, you were talking earlier on about this, which I missed sadly, but you know, the marriage or the sort of match between the build-to-rent sector and this type of construction is very obvious to us. Um, the only strange thing is that some of the build-to-rent people don't seem to have figured this out yet. And then a couple of other projects, just to demonstrate that nothing, not everything has to be sort of square and boxy. Um, these are all either on the drawing board or, or in planning or, um, or through planning. And they're all either built to rent or student accommodation. And all of them were designed to be modular. That doesn't mean they all will be modular when they're constructed, but this sort of issue of thinking about these things from the beginning. So at least if, if we as designers can provide the, you know, that type of design from the beginning, um, then it can still be built traditionally. But if you start out with a traditional design and don't consider volumetric, then it's harder, if not impossible, to retrofit and satisfy everybody. Um, and actually, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the height, so vision modular structures are now pretty confident they can get to this height. So even in, in the last five years or so, we've seen a development in that whole technology from where 20 stories, 21 stories was where everybody was happy with. Now we've got people saying that they can go to 35, 36 stories um, within a five-year period. So there is a lot of innovation going on. So in terms of the digital side of things, so this is one of the um, essential living apartments. So the typical built-to-rent apartment with a living space in the middle and a bedroom and bathroom either side which will be shipped to site as three fully completed um, volumetric modules. And this is a federated, mod mo uh, federated model with the structures and the MEP and the facade, each supplying their own digital model. And this is the first time, first project we've been involved in where the, the digital model of the structure will be used for manufacturing. So that's a really sort of nice sort of point we think to be at where we can start to see how a single shared model, um, the, the, you know, the model isn't being passed on to someone else who's going to do a set of shop drawings and then all that sort of marking up business. We're actually using the digital system for its full potential. So um, I think I'll stop there because I think we've got some time for questions and I'm sure there's plenty of questions to be asked. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.